this is a committee of uh, hearing for the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, we're continuing to take testimony on the uh, remainder of the FY21 uh, budget. And today we have with us uh, from the Agency of Human Services, um, Commissioner Hutt, and I believe she has staff, I believe, yes. Um, Megan is here, as well as Sarah Clark from uh, the Agency um, Fiscal Chief Fiscal Officer. Um, so we're going to get started uh, with your um, testimony right now. We'll just go through uh, what you're uh, requesting in terms of your uh, any changes to your restated um, budget request that was received okay. in January. I don't know if you have a document uh, for us to look at. Um, if so, um, uh, do you have that, Chrissy or? Okay, great. So this is your traditional uh, summary sheet. It's very helpful. Um, this is, yes. All right, we, we sort of know who you are in your five divisions. So we'll scroll down a little more, Chrissy. This is the sheet probably that we'll want to look at. And um, Monica, do you want to uh, run through this with us? Um, Absolutely. In terms of the overview. Absolutely. Thanks all for having me. Monica Hutt, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. And I think you noticed that our Deputy Commissioner, Megan Tierney Ward, is on the line, as well as Bill Kelly, our Chief Financial Officer. Um, and then, of course, Sarah is there. So I apologize. I'm not sure why there are all these funny symbols in this stuff. I, I don't know, but the other, um, that's a legislative um, uh, symbol that we use but somebody needs to go on mute we're getting a lot of background noise like shuffling of paper or okay it's stopped now okay. um but um so i don't know what happened but we'll um it doesn't change the figures at all it so. doesn't it doesn't it's just it's a little bit distracting but it's fine and i'm happy to walk through it so as you noted um Senator, this is a, a narrative that Bill Kelly puts together, and the numbers all map to the ups and downs on the on the financial sheets, but it's a lot easier to look at it here. So mm -hmm. I'll just start at the top and, and work my way through and um, just pause for questions and let me know if, if you want me to do anything differently. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, so uh, the first section here is just a summary of the overall budget. So you'll see that in total, there's a net increase requested of 3,009,833. Um, and these, this is a summary of what you'll see in each of the appropriations. So I won't spend time here. I'll move right into the appropriations, but just for you to know that this summarizes the total request. Okay. All right. So Chrissy, if you want to roll down just a little bit, but thank you, that's perfect. The first, um, the first the appropriation is the um, administration, our administrative appropriation. Um, there are three items for you to see here. Um, the first is an increase to our vacancy savings across the department. You will recall that all of the Dale salaries, all of our staff are rolled in our administrate into this administration appropriation. So this increase to vacancy savings um, uh, is in is proposed here. There are no reductions to staff proposed in the Dale um, budget right now, just this increase to vacancy savings, which we will be able to achieve through just the hiring freeze that exists right now, um, slowing down some of our hiring. It is our intent to continue to fill vacancies as they come up, but just to do that a little bit more slowly to hit this target. This represents about a 3.25% vacancy savings, so still a pretty reasonable um, amount for the department to operate with. The second item is a decrease from to all of our internal service funds allocations. So the fees for human resources, for the Agency of Digital Services, fee for space, um, all of those things, and those um, were given to us through the administration. So that is that second number. And then the third number, the travel reduction is a modest $25,000, 
but achievable um, just because we've got staff that are not moving around and haven't been for the past few months and looks like that will continue at least until the middle of the year, um, till December. So we believe that we can receive, easily achieve that travel reduction across the department. Should I pause after each? each uh, no, uh, we know that, the, that there's been a, a freeze on hiring and a review process. We know about the internal service funds and we know about travel. So those are pretty standard uh, uh, adjustments that we've been seeing. So uh, unless there's any questions, I, I think you should probably just uh, move on to the next section. Okay. So under Dale Grants, there are two items. Um, you are all familiar with our Medicaid attendance services program. So different from the general fund attendance services program, which you will recall is frozen. This is the Medicaid attendance services program. And this is a proposed uh, underutilization of $100,000 in that program. Um, certainly it, it reduces the, the um, wiggle room in that program, but we believe we still have some flex there um, and can continue to meet needs even with this reduction in place. Um, and then the second is actually a one-time reduction for our adult day programs. Um, as you will recall, they received coronavirus relief funds um, for the next three months to supplant all of their operating costs. So this is just a one-time reduction and the CRF funds are offsetting that. Okay, oh, that's okay, that makes sense. Because uh, adult days were the one program simply because of the congregate nature um, were, were closed, similar to childcare as well. So obviously, uh, but um, that had a huge economic impact, but which we addressed through the CRF. Yes, exactly. So then there are no changes proposed in DBVI, um, the Division for the Blind or Visually Impaired, or Voc Rehab. So I'll ask Chrissy. Oh, I, I want to go back to the adult day. I'm sorry. Oh, sure, that's um, okay. Um, and I know Sarah Clark is on, and we've had some communication um, that the CRF money, the agency, uh, and obviously some of this is timing in order to know what we have for money that uh, would not be expended um, so that it can be reallocated because our goal is obviously not to uh, return any of the CRF money um, uh, to Washington. So um, I'm sure you've been hearing some concern about that October um, deadline. And I think that there's one thing, there's a difference between expending it as opposed to having confidence that between October and December 20th, the money will be spent. Um, has that concern been brought to your attention, Monica, or, um, or maybe Sarah can speak to it in terms of how the agency um, is going to um, uh, have a, a system in place to make sure money is available that's, um, that, that will be spent after October um, versus that, that would need to be reallocated? Sarah, do you want me to jump in and then you can fill in or correct me if I misspeak? That sounds good. Okay. Um, so we do, we are going to, the, the adult days will need to reconcile um, the dollars that they received at the end of that first quarter. So July, August, and September. Um, but they certainly, I believe, will be able to continue to expend them. And in fact, um, one of the issues that we are up against with the adult day programs is that although they are beginning to reopen and they've got a reopening plan in place, that's going to happen slowly. And for many of them, they're going to need to reduce their census in order to enable them to reopen safely and still meet the mandates from the Vermont Department of Health in terms of distancing and, and um, the number of folks that can be in one space at one time. So we are planning to begin to work with them in the coming week to really ascertain how much of those operating dollars they're going to be able to spend by the end of that first quarter. And then if they need additional dollars to su supplement that 50% census reduction, um, we, we should be able to identify that within those funds um, and determine if there's additional need from there forward. I have a question from Senator Nitka. I'm just wondering, is it expected that all of them will be able to reopen? 
That's a great question. We did a survey with them and I don't have that up in front of me. Um, it looks like about 80% of them are feeling like they can reopen at some capacity. Some are just too tiny um, to be able to make that work. And that's certainly um, one of the issues that we're up against. And so they may not be able to reopen, but it will be very um, individual, Senator, in terms of what each is able to do. And we will have to work with them individually. Um, I shared with House Appropriations earlier today that there was a call this week that I wasn't able to be on, but the director for our adult services program was on nationally talking about adult day programs because every state is facing the exact same issue. It's such a critical service. It provides a very important um, support to families. And yet there's no way to get around the fact that it's absolutely in person with a really vulnerable population. So um, it, it presents this dynamic that's hard to, to work around with this virus um, right now. So I don't know what Angela discovered from that national call, but I think we're going to try to align with what's happening nationally as well and understand best practice for them. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, Monica, one thing, um, the closure of the adult days, this has been a critical part of uh, keeping um, our seniors and people with disabilities in their homes. So how are you experiencing or how have you been able to accommodate the, uh, the closure of this service um, and still um, uh, make sure that people are able to um, remain in their homes? And has it resulted in the need to um, add, uh, I don't know, more um, maybe personal care um, on the other side? In other words, uh, have you had to compensate? Or are you experiencing a higher demand somewhere else with other services during this period of closure? So it's a great question. What we've been able to do throughout the whole time has been to shift dollars within people's budgets, right? So not that people have specific, well, people do have specific service plans. So we've been able to um, allow people to shift their service plan to accommodate the fact that they weren't using adult day and to be able to put that into additional respite or some other kinds of supports for families. So I think that that flexibility has been really helpful and that's been able to accommodate some of the pressure, but I will be very candid with you and say, I don't imagine that it has covered all of the pressure that families have experienced. I'm sure that there is still a lot of uh, many families that have had to step into a more um, demanding caregiver roles for family members. So I, I think that we're gonna continue to see that pressure, absolutely. Um, I don't think that we've seen, you know, one of the things that we worried most about was would people end up having to go into nursing homes because they weren't seeing the adult day um, as a service available to them. And I don't think we've seen that, although we've certainly heard anecdotally that that's a pressure, but I don't think we've seen that necessarily yet but it is something we have to address because it has been, as you said, vital for families up till now. Okay. Other questions of the committee? Okay, well then we'll keep going. Is Diane Delma still working? <laughs> is she still VR director? She is 40 plus years. Oh, oh my gosh. I know, and she truly is the most creative human being I think I've ever met. She doesn't run out of steam at all. It's not as if she's just occupying space. She is charging forward. Sometimes it's hard to keep up. Oh, all right. Huh. Well, uh, huh. Alice, another familiar name. Um, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, glad to hear it. Yes, we're lucky to have her. Um, so in now we're into the developmental services appropriation, and, and this is a budget to actuals adjustment. We did this as well in the FY21 governor's recommend. You will recall this is really a, a, an artifact of the way that developmental services is funded on, on a cash basis. And so there, this is dollars that do not impact services. There are no reductions to providers. There's no impact to individuals with this adjustment. Okay, uh, Senator Ash. I um, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner. On this one, I think that the developmental service organizations suffer from historical budgeted amounts. Um, <clears throat> their ability to pay has been hampered by the appropriations they've received for a long period of time. 
So I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, on the other hand, that 1.6 million could be used to increase the pay of these positions at the lower end who basically get paid so little that they're often eligible for benefits. And the reason I mention this is I put it in the context of positions at some of our hospitals for PR positions that cost three quarters of a million, which are probably a third Medicaid and eliminate one position, it would free up 250,000 in Medicaid and we could use it to increase the pay of some of these people. So I hope that the committee will revisit this because just because there's been a structural unfairness um, for many, many years between some high paid administrators who don't provide care and actual people on the ground who do the grunt work and get paid next to nothing, we shouldn't necessarily let it persist in this kind of adjustment. In um, light of, uh, obviously we've been very concerned about, and as well as on the mental health side. And I know, um, uh, speaking of the wages and the concern out of, uh, regarding people providing the care, um, I, I believe I've heard very good things about um, Dale's response to um, the staffing and uh, recognizing uh, what it um, what it means for the direct care um, staff. Um, and I, I just not, wanted to. Yeah, I'm not criticizing I, Dale. Or no, no, I, I, I know you're I, not. But I, I think I, we have to put everything in context. There are positions at UVMMC, people who make 750000 with benefits to basically send out press releases. A third of that is probably Medicaid spending, which we could deploy to mm -hmm. assist Dale to provide higher contracted amounts to developmental service organizations so that they can pay people, yeah. you know, one thin dime more each an hour if we need to, to use the Sorokinism. Um, and it, we obviously don't always look at things as a comparison, but literally one position could be eliminated at one hospital and we'd provide meaningful increases in pay for hundreds of people who are uh, in this category here. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to detract from the point that you were making, and that is how uh, in balance uh, we're seeing um, where uh, public funds end up, uh, uh, where they end up. It's a, I ju it just triggered the thought that I just wanted to give uh, the staff some positive feedback uh, for what- it, uh, Dale does an amazing job. I, and I absolutely think they've been the standouts in a way of this whole pandemic from the very earliest days before the state of emergency. So I, I would echo that mm -hmm. and um, commend the commissioner and the whole team. But literally one position could be eliminated at one hospital and Commissioner Hutt could call with a congratulatory call to the developmental service organization saying there was gonna be a buck an hour increase for hundreds of people. Might even help with uh, uh, premiums people pay. It would, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Uh, any other comments about the this ad adjustment? This is uh, obviously this gets reconciled at the end of the year. So it's do you do it at the beginning or you do it at the end? So um, uh, this is sort of a truing up, but it does raise the, a much larger discussion around how healthcare dollars are spent. Um, TBI, um, uh, um, this is just an adjustment based on act utilization um, experience. Is yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. So it's it's just a, a it's an underutilization. Um, it leaves us a little bit of headroom in the program still, but it certainly makes it tight. You know, I will- How many individuals are being served now um, under this waiver? Oh my gosh, it's a great question. Um, Bill, do you have that? I want to say it's, I have like 75 in my head, but I think that that's too high. I was thinking around 50, but I, I just was wondering. Um, yeah, my apologies. I am usually prepared with that and I don't have it right in front of me. Oh, well, um, I can understand that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I think it's about, I am getting a quick phone a friend text, which you can't see, but it's about 75. 75? Yeah. And it, as, as you know, Bill will, Kelly just said approximately. Oh, he said 40. I have dueling information from Megan and Bill. Um, actually, it's very helpful. And maybe it's in the do, um, other documentation, but 
Um, it's in our, it's certainly in the FY21, the program narrative in our, yeah, yeah. Um, in our say, original I'm submission. Sure, yeah, the, absolutely. This, uh, the number of people being served in these programs. Okay. Yes, that's absolutely in our, um, in our program summary. Um, and I will say and that. Chrissy, Chrissy, could I just ask a question? Then all that material, so we'll just go in. It's on the um, Appropriations Committee document um, handout. It is. Um, it will. It will be shortly. I'm having a computer glitch getting it loaded, but as soon as we break, it will be up there. All right. Thank you. So, committee members, if anyone wants to get into that level of detail, it will be available um, on the committee. Um, website. We, we can certainly follow up with that too, just so that you've got it straight from us. My apologies for the miscommunication. Um, just as a reminder and traumatic in the TBI program, it's a, it's a rehab program. So it ebbs and flows for individuals that need um, continued care. They shift into a longer term um, under our Choices for Care program. So um, Bill is continuing to tell us. <laughs> <nice. laughs> 40 and, and they, 40. So what he's saying is everybody is right. Every, which is, isn't that the way that it should be? Oh, <laughs> so about 40 in the rehab program and about 40 in the longer term care portion of our choices for care program under TBI. So about 80 total. I just want, I want Bill Kelly to note that I was right to start with. I just want him to, I don't know if he can type and acknowledge that. That would make me really happy, but he won't. <laughs> And then well, we'll, we'll go ahead. I'm no, sorry. I was going to say we'll look to see if we get a um, a message. Oh, he's saying <laughs> he hears. You. He, he does hear you. All right, choices for care. Fair um, enough. It's as much of an acknowledgement as I'm going to get. So, um, in choices for care, this is actually where we're requesting an increase. Um, as you know, the choices for care budget is built on a three-year caseload average. That's how we build it typically. And for this FY21, um, our estimates were just too low. And we're seeing actuals that are demonstrating a higher um, caseload numbers and also higher cost per care within that caseload. So this is a requested increase to that budget. Okay. Hmm. Questions, um, committee, this is obviously um, a program where we track it. Senator Sears, you've got your hand up. Yes, um, I just wanna make sure that the choices for care are available in generally statewide and not in specific areas. I'm getting. No, oh, absolutely, it's a statewide program. Yeah, could you give me a, uh, just a synopsis of the, you know, don't have to do it today, but could you send me some information on the different um, practitioners and around the state that are taking advantage of choices for care? Sure. I mean, so it just as... A Here, let me be clear. The adult days are basically closed. And that was one of the options. So how we replaced that type of programming during covid Right. So Choices for Care, the organizations that we deliver Choices for Care through are through Home Health, the Area Agencies on Aging, um, and, and there is a sort of direct service in people's homes in addition to the adult day programs. Um, and and um, I kind of think what I'm missing here. Well, that's where I, I, I want to focus a little bit on the adult days because they're, I think they're all closed. They are all closed right now. And some of them are, were, we were worried during the CARES Act that some of them were going out of business. And I don't know what the situation is for them um, between now and whenever they're allowed to reopen. But I'm also concerned about what happens to the vulnerable people that are not able to access uh, an adult home day as more and more people go back to work. You know, it's been, in many cases, a family member has taken over the role because they're home unemployed. But as more people go back to work, I think the situation gets exasperated. And I want to make sure we have enough money <clears throat> to support those and other programs that are vital to seniors who need help. Absolutely. I appreciate your concern. So I, I would, yeah, if we could get kind of a 
email letter, maybe Senator Kitchell knows more, but. Well, I, I uh, just wanted to, um, uh, maybe Sarah Clark can uh, confirm this, but the, when we did the uh, Q1 budget, we actually separated out funding for our adult day system. It's so they're not having to compete as part of that um, uh, provider stabilization. Good. And that was two and, uh, did, was, it, was it two and a half a million or 2.4 that we- 2.45. Um, 2.45, yeah. <laughs> okay. The question is, Senator, how long does that last? Mm. Will it get us through a pandemic? I just saw where the court has extended its emergency orders till uh, December 31st. Oh my gosh, um, I'm never gonna get my back rent. <laughs> probably not. Um, and that the, um, and my concern is what's happened. I'm grateful that we're keeping our adult days afloat and not letting them go bankrupt. But I am concerned during the pandemic, what happens to the people that were using adult days? How are they being dealt with? That's my concern. So I, I guess it's more than, um, I, I was aware that we had helped them out. I don't know how long that'll last, but it looks like emergency orders are going to get extended. If the, if we follow the court, we're talking about at least six more months, uh, four more months of emergency orders and probably into 2021. So, so the, the question, I guess, for Sarah and Monica is with the appropriation that we did move out ahead separately, recognizing that this provider group were closed down entirely. Um, uh, did the uh, CRF appropriation, and unfortunately we can't spend beyond December 30th, um, do we need to um, consider additional money? And I was reading the, and the other part of this is senior nutrition, um, and that was the Meals on Wheels and um, yep. the concern around that, and which we did put money in through the Joint Fiscal Committee um, to meet those higher costs. Uh, at 600,000, but the report would suggest that, uh, um, and I, I'm glad that Megan is here, um, but I guess it was Angela who put that report together um, that um, suggests that uh, to keep those higher reimbursement would take another f almost 570,000. So I, I'm just uh, uh, wanna throw that in Dick as well, because it seems to me uh, the nutrition side is also an important part of uh, uh, seniors at home um, and getting the meals to them. So um, I don't think that uh, the budget or the CRF budget that has been, will be presented to us um, includes that higher uh, meal reimbursement or if we needed to do more money um, to for the adult day through the end of December, what would that be? So I think that's your question, Dick, is... Uh, uh, um, you know, what are we doing for people that had been at the adult days and been, yeah. um, you know, it was the the caregiver was, was in many cases has been able to stay home with the adult day patient and take mm -hmm. care of them. But as these folks... You know, we spent a lot of time on how we reopen schools and the need for child care um, facilities. So, uh, we're, well, we haven't, okay. I don't, haven't heard any conversation about the need for help for uh, senior citizens or other disabled folks who the, need those the, type of services. The other thing that we did, and then I see Senator Westman's hand is up, and that um, we have many of the uh, these seniors are served by personal care providers mm -hmm. that are funded, um, the pay goes through ARIS. And so um, the hazard pay, um, can you just speak to that, Monica? Is that, uh, I, uh, I know that's happening right now. I think uh, um, Sarah indicated that over 400 employers had, um, had requested that hazard pay. Um, so can you speak to your experience as it relates to the choices for care um, population? Sure, so, so a couple different questions all wrapped up in that. Um, maybe to, to start with um, 
Senator Sears and the question around um, the adult day programs and what's happening there. As, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in testimony, what we've tried to do is, or what we've done is given maximum flexibility to those individuals to be able to shift dollars that would have gone to adult day to use them um, as respite or for a fam from a family perspective to actually have a family pay themselves to be providing some of that care. So you can make that kind of shift within your own service plan, within your own service budget, if you're not using dollars in one area like adult day to plug that into another area so that those dollars become available to you. So that is certainly one of the ways that we tried to create flexibility to support families where adult day wasn't possible. You're right in that there has been operational support for the adult day programs to keep them afloat as this has unfolded. And we are working, Megan has done um, a full survey with all of the adult days to understand their capacity to reopen. They do in fact now have, a, have an approved reopening plan, um, but it is still um, a little bit of a scary proposition for a lot of them. And reopening safely will require them to reduce their census a little bit in order to meet all those safety guidelines. And so again, we're working with them individually to understand which of them feel like they can open and can can those dollars, the CRF dollars that have already been allocated, support them to even maintain operations with a reduced census beyond September? As I said, they need to reconcile by the end of September, but if they can identify the need going forward, if there's enough money in that original allocation of CRF, they can use that to supplement that lost census. Um, and then if there's, and once we figure that out, knowing what they have now, what their costs are, we're going to work with them individually to do that. In fact, Sarah and I have been communicating about that pretty recently. Um, we will uh, determine if there's a need for additional funding to get them through to the end of the availability of CRF funds, so December, to supplement that, that census. What we really want is for them to reopen as much as they possibly can, because as Senator Sears pointed out, it's absolutely a vital service, and it's pretty challenging to replace other than in a physical spot with day, daytime supports. That's what people are looking for. Um, in terms of the meals programs, there was a $600,000 CRF appropriation that has just been um, uh, approved through joint fiscal for senior centers and meal programs. And that was money that um, filled the gap between their costs and expenses and actually the enhanced rate that area agencies on aging have been able to provide to them. So even still there was a delta between their expenses and that enhanced rate. The report that Joint Fiscal got on the 18th spoke specifically to the ability of area agencies on aging to continue that enhanced rate and to do so through the end of December or to December, I guess, um, we are estimating that would be about $565,000. And so um, we submitted that report to Joint Fiscal on the 18th. I think um, we were waiting to hear back if that was something that Joint Fiscal wanted us to pursue. We, we, we were offering the estimate, but I hadn't taken any additional steps at this point in time with that. So as a, a money committee then, um, that additional funding of the 565 that's referenced in the report, and Sarah, uh, you can confirm this, that, that has not, is not reflected in any of the proposals that have been um, uh, submitted to us. That's correct. So, so I guess, uh, you know, obviously we're not gonna be turning around, we've got the budget, then we've got the CRF uh, decisions to make. So maybe there's a little bit more time to refine um, uh, the, the question about uh, uh, will additional money over the what we appropriated in the uh, Q1 budget uh, be required? And if you could get us some sense of what that might be, I think um, uh, the committee would be um, would be very interested because uh, obviously our our top priority is feeding and making sure that our seniors and people with disabilities are uh, cared for. Senator Westman. If I wait long enough, um, a lot of this gets answered. Um, I, I just say to you, Monica, I would like to sit down um, and um, with you and um, your staff in that. 
Um, I understand you've done a survey of what it would take to open um, and the, the things that they need to do, particularly around the adult days. Um, I'd like to compare that to a budget. Um, what are the things they need to do if they're going to be going at a um, um, lower staffing level and or not staffing level, but lower census numbers? Um, what's that going to take? What are the extra things they need to reopen? If I've got one in five that um, are small but aren't going to reopen, are there things we can do to encourage them to reopen? So basically, um, what would, and I think that's mostly um, on CRF money, um, that we could if we open before the end of the year. So I'd like to see a budget around that. Okay. Um, Senator Ash, I think you're yeah, the on the, next. On, the, on the meals uh, front, I commissioner, okay. maybe just to plant a seed, it, it does see, I think the action of the Joint Fiscal Committee was very good since the meals themselves, the, the funds to the maximum extent possible should go to the people actually delivering and you know preparing the meals. I hope you'll do some thinking about how we make sure on a permanent basis, more money goes to support healthy meals being produced and delivered at the local level and not get sucked up in administrative expenses somewhere in the between the agency and those actually doing the direct work. So it's just a flag for future discussion. Absolutely. Okay. Other uh, questions? Um, I'm just checking my time, 209. Um, we have Sean Brown, who's, uh, I, I don't know if he's in the waiting room or listening. Other questions of um, folks from Dale? Okay, so Monica, you'll be refining uh, and getting more information um, in, in light of Senator Westman's and the other uh, questions that have been asked. Senator Ash? I would uh, request that um, the commissioner, if you can uh, get back to me and or the committee with um, what we could do to increase wages at developmental services organizations for every $250,000 we are able to come up with. I I, I just say that uh, I wrote that question down. So when we separately meet Monica, I am going to bring it up. Okay. Um, Monica, did we not um, move, uh, refresh, but um, your, those employees did get moved to the $15 mm -hmm. an hour? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Across the development of services designated agency system. Yes. Okay. All right. Other questions? Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Chrissy, do we have uh, Commissioner Brown? He's not in the room yet. He should be joining us shortly. We have Sarah still. Any more questions of Sarah? Huh? It is Friday and, uh, oh, it's Tim. Do you have well, a question, I mean, Sarah? If we've, got the, if we've got the time. Um, <laughs> sorry, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, you might, don't, don't mute yourself, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to return to this issue of sort of the morality of how much we spend on certain positions using Medicaid funds versus others who do direct frontline work. And obviously, if someone is a heart surgeon, and Medicaid covers the heart surgery, we're gonna be paying a, you know, a, a significant amount of money over the course of a year for that individual's salary. And I don't think there's any, you know, no one's gonna have a qualm with that. There are other positions which have proliferated over the years with some of them are politically connected people. Some of them are people who get into these drifting administrative positions with no actual benefit, who make substantial amounts of money. And I'm wondering if the administration thought at all about limiting Medicaid uh, distributions in support of certain positions um, so that it could free up money where it's much uh, more greatly needed. Thanks, Senator Ash. I did take um, notes of your question and I will take it back with leadership at the Agency of Human Services. To put a finer point maybe then, I'll just say there are positions out there that I think we would all say the whole world wouldn't even notice if they didn't exist anymore. 
At the same time, we say we don't have more money for nurses. We don't have more money for LPNs. We don't have more money for developmental services. We don't have any more money for this, that, and the other. The truth is we do have the money, but a lot of it gets sucked up by a small number of politically connected people. So if you can see if there's any interest in um, perhaps cataloging certain job types for which it's not just or justifiable to ship major amounts of state funds to support them on an annual basis so that we could use it in areas where we have already acknowledged we have real problems with retention or recruitment uh, and so on. So if you can pose it in that way, not meant to be punitive towards one, but rather redistributive in a more fair and productive way for the state. And I guess Here's one good. area that you could look, and that is where uh, uh, the agency has control, and that is in the rate setting process. Now, a lot of uh, some of the positions that are being referenced would go through the hospital budget review process, but um, it could look at at least for those rates that are established and controlled by the agency directly is a, also um, a good place. Senator Sears. You're muted. I heard oh. the word rate setting. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should never. never RS. Let me let me uh, suggest oh, that but that's that's, a, that's your initial. I can't use RS because you'd say no. I was talking about you, Richard Sears. Right. Rate setting mm -hmm. could be um, expanded to those facilities so that Senator Ash's can well meant concern is addressed. That still doesn't take away from my initial position that the division of rate settings should be disbanded and sent uh, to some other, those positions should be sent to other places where they could be helpful. However, as long as you all want to continue a division of rate setting, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> The, the, Vermont, the Vermont Supreme Court has ruled that the legislature does have um, legal authority to get into the administrative affairs of hospitals and domestic insurance companies. So yeah, Senator that Sears, was statute, the and, you know, in our legislative work, we could, uh, if we chose, intervene. Hmm. So, Monica, you've lifted us to a very different uh, uh, a level of conversation, and that is the disparity and uh, how our healthcare dollars or our healthcare costs, uh, what um, the different um, realities of how that money is being spent, which ultimately is paid by either public programs or um, through the insurance uh, premium process. So, do we have uh, Commissioner Brown yet? Yes, we do. Do we have anybody from DCF who wants to talk to us? We sure do. Sure. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank Hi, you very everybody. much, Megan and uh, Monica and Bill. Bill's Thank already you. left. Um, Bye. -bye. Okay. So uh, uh, we have um, Sean is with us. Sarah is going to stay on. Um, we have Sarah. Um, was in charge of your money and uh, anyone else, Sean? No, I believe that's uh, the DCF contingent today. Okay, uh, uh, Sarah plus the two of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to go through um, the budget. The other part, of course, um, that you're walking into by becoming commissioner is the whole discussion around Woodside. And I see Senator Sears is left temporarily. So why don't we um, uh, and we also, um, you've got the child care, which is going to be a topic of discussion in terms of the 12 million uh, proposal that is coming to joint fiscal committee on Monday. So I'm sure this um, uh, committee would be interested in what's being proposed as well. So if you wanted to just, um, uh, do you have a document that you want us to put on the screen to walk us through in terms of your restatement? Uh, for yes, we uh, earlier today provided a PowerPoint presentation that I can walk you through that will highlight um, um, uh, the restatement ups and downs. All right. So do you you have that, Chrissy? I do. I'm just pulling it up. Just give me one moment, please. So All right. Thank you. Get that ready. Okay. 
Okay. Can you all see that? Yes, it's uh, very good. Thank you. And this is the um, screen you want to start with, Sean? Sure, just uh, at a real high level, just uh, to refresh the committee, um, DCF's a, a large department within the Agency of Human Services. We have uh, over a thousand staff. Um, and uh, um, when you add in the EBT money that doesn't flow through the Three Squares Vermont program, but which comes through the treasury to uh, our EBT vendor, we approach a half a billion dollars of uh, of dollars running through our various programs and divisions to support Vermont's uh, children and families uh, throughout the various services that we provide. And if we move to the next screen, it just kind of highlights um, um, uh, no, the third page of the PowerPoint. Yes, right here. Um, that the biggest division is family services, just kind of highlights where our staff are, are allocated throughout uh, the department, just for the committee's reference. Um, the admin includes the economic services staff, the business office, um, the registry review unit staff, and then the, and the commissioner's office as well. Um, and then OCS, um, disability determination, OEO, uh, Woodside, um, and the child development division. Um, so we're a rather large, expansive uh, department covering lots of different services. Um, moving on to the next page, I just wanted to um, highlight some of the initiatives that we might touch on in, in, in our budget restatement or from the original gover governor's recommended budget. Um, uh, the first one in economic services, the uh, uh, elderly simplified application program, uh, we had um, proposed uh, implementing that um, July 1st uh, of this year, but due to COVID, we pushed that um, rollout um, to October 1st, and we're on schedule uh, for that initiative to go live then uh, for the committee's uh, refresher. Um, this is a waiver we received from the USDA Food Nutrition Service that allows us to streamline and simplify um, the application and recertification requirements for households who fall under two categories, either older Vermonters or disabled Vermonters, which is about half our caseload, um, really makes it easier um, for those populations to access and stay on the program. And so we're excited uh, that we're able to still roll that out um, coming October 1st. Um, it actually has a new name, which we didn't put in here. It's uh, Three Squares Vermont in a snap. So if you hear that name, that's what that's referring to. It's no longer referred to as ESAP um, as we roll it out. Also, you'll see that we're proposing in the governor's restated budget um, to bring in um, the CCFAP eligibility service um, into um, DCF. Um, we're right now we contract with partners across the state. Some of those are parent child centers to do uh, eligibility. Um, we have an eligibility service, uh, you know, experienced staff in the ESD, which would streamline the process and provide um, uh, one-stop shopping for those families that participate in the, all the benefit programs that we have to offer at DCF. Um, and so we can talk about that more when we get to that specific area of the budget. Um, also, FSD, okay. Uh, yes. Okay, it, and that's been proposed in the past and it's been um, met with um, obviously uh, concern by some of those community partners that were mm -hmm. doing that, I believe. Um, Senator Westman, um, we'll get into this more, but is this, um, are we going to be getting, um, um, are there people that don't, uh, that oppose this? Um, yesterday um, in our testimony in House Appropriations, um, we heard some concern that this could destabilize the parent-child centers who uh, for, I think there's at least six of them who um, have uh, grants to do this work um, and that this could de destabilize them financially. That was raised by Representative Iacoboni. Um, and so we're gathering more information to provide additional details uh, to the committees and we'll have that early next week and we can share that uh, with Senator Westman and your committee as well. 
All right, Senator Sears, your hand is yes, up. Yes, I have an email from my parent child center as well, and they feel that this will <clears throat> that this proposal um, is not a new proposal. It was an effort uh, to move this a number of years ago with strong advocacy that didn't happen. I hope it will not happen this time, so I'm reaching out to you. Um, years ago, it was a state position. It was moved to a community partner. Sunrise was identified as the partner. That is a, uh, you know, one of the parent-child centers. Um, and uh, in an effort to save money for the state, um, there are many uncertainties this time regarding the proposal. Um, thanks. For so the hard I work. guess it we'll be hearing more on that. Uh, and um, I'm sure the budget assumes some savings from doing that consolidation from a um, from a eligibility perspective. It makes sense to if you're processing that data and that financial information, and it's a means tested to do it all as a one process, but um, that's why I raised the question. So obviously, Senator Sears, you've already got an email, and I'm yep. sure other people will start getting them as well. Okay. Yep, and we're happy to have further conversations as well um, with committee, uh, the, uh, this committee and its members um, for to provide additional information. Um, uh, uh, turning to FSD, we continue to evaluate evaluate our residential system of care, particularly um, in our use of um, out-of-state placements. We have been able to make some progress in reducing our reliance on out-of-state treatment programs and bringing some of the youth back to and provide those services in state and that work, conti work continues. Um, also, um, you know, this July, the Raise the Age went into effect. And so we're uh, working across the state with our justice partners uh, to roll that out and assess what, what uh, programs and services, um, how they can be strengthened and improved as, as we move, move forward with this and as we learn, um, as we move forward and learn from, from its implementation. Um, and then also, as you indicated in the beginning, um, Woodside is going to be a complicated conversation. A lot of moving pieces to that um, going on right now, and, and we're happy to have that conversation with the committee. Um, uh, the child development division. Uh, well, before forward. you, can I ask a question, make a comment about that, Madam Chair? Yes, yes go right ahead. Um, Joint Justice Oversight met yesterday on the issue of Woodside, among other issues. And it's clear that uh, we will be sending a letter to the other legislators um, saying that we're not ready to put a stamp of approval on the plan because the plan really isn't in place. Although there isn't, I mean, there is objection from the BSAA and others about the plan. That's not our. That's not as much our concern as the concern that will this work for those kids? And currently, we have one kid at Woodside that they are having difficulty placing. We have one kid at the Sununu Center lockup, and so will they be able to have a full-fledged plan by the time we act on the twenty? 21 third, uh, three quarter budget. So, well, that's yeah. going um, to be very quick, Dick, because that, well, we have to have this quick, in place by if, the 25th if, of September. Well, but if we, if, but in my opinion, if we approve this and um, <clears throat> the timing couldn't be worse, I don't think, I don't think we want to approve this. Um, in this budget without a better plan. Um, okay. Um, I mean, I, to... I'm hopeful that by the time we begin marking up the bill in two weeks that, or whatever it is, that the commissioner will have us better information on the different plans that he discussed mm -hmm. with us yesterday. I, I realize we're moving at a quick pace, but it isn't like tomorrow. So I'm just suggesting that we hopefully will have some better idea um, before we adjourn um, okay. whenever that might be. Uh, it may be that the Senate uh, Appropriations Committee actually has to deal with it because um, we're coming after the House. Yeah, okay. So I just um, wanted to alert you to that. I'm not, I don't think the committee, the Justice Oversight Committee is opposed to the phase down. It's just that we don't think the plan is ready. Okay. 
All right. So what you're saying is it's still under development and and the and and you're not willing to sign right. off on it yet. But hopefully, right. before the Senate finishes up the budget, we'll have a better sense of the plan. I, I hope so. For one example, we don't know if the private provider that they may be working with will be able to get Medicaid match. We need to know that before we put it. Because you know, yeah. we've been down that road before, if you remember. Dick, you and I have held hands and jumped off that cliff, remember? Yeah, I know, but I hate to jump off it again. Uh, all right, it's, uh, Senator Ash. So I, I agree that we want to make sure we have a workable plan when we, whatever, whenever we resolve what's going to be next. But just for shorthand for me, before when we, there were very, the census count was like two or three, depending on the day. Um, and I think Steve Howard assured us that sometimes it was an average of 3.1, not three. Um, we were spending $6 million, I believe was the rough operating, uh, cost. Um, I'm just wondering at this time, setting aside how many individuals would be appropriate for the, the, the classic Woodside facility. What is the, what is the current operating cost projection? if we were to keep Woodside as is, is it still that 6 million or have there been changes as a result of all the, you know, back and forth and back and forth again, that's been happening the last year? You will see um, in our, uh, in, in the governor's uh, restatement that we are um, proposing um, reducing staffing levels based on uh, the program that's currently being provided and the number of youth and what would be an appropriate level of staffing. And I, and, um, and so we're looking to reduce from a $6 million up, up operating budget, more or less in prior years to approximately 4.1. They, they also have five um, staff members on administrative leave and they're looking at whether or not they should be charged with child abuse based upon restraints. And there's some other incidents as well. So that so does add to the, those people are being paid, but they're not there. Oh. Uh, Senator Ash, your hand's still up. You have another question? Well, I don't know if I have to comment, physically, physically, physically take it down, but how many, um, how many, uh, and I know it's tricky because there's been so much movement back and forth the last bunch of months, but, about six months ago, we would have been saying that there was somewhere between one and five kids at any moment in time, depending on the day, or zero and five, I should say. How many right now are Woodside, you know, kids? Right now, we have one youth in the facility, which we believe... Um, would benefit from a, a different treatment program, which we're trying to work with and develop and, and then um, get court permission to move that youth to. Um, as Senator Sears indicated, we do have one youth placed at the Sununu Center who um, had we not stopped taking admissions due to safety and programmatic concerns would have been at Woodside um, at, at this time, but we were able to place that youth um, through the interstate compact, and that youth was from another state, actually, who ended up in Vermont. Um, and um, so right now, there's one at Woodside, but potentially there's this other youth who's at this new new center who would have been wood in Woodside had we not closed down admissions due to safety concerns. As Senator Sears indicated, um, there was an incident um, involving five staff in a, uh, in a restraint of a youth that was incredibly dangerous and problematic. Um, and those staff are on, on leave pending an HR investigation, but there's also a residential licensing investigation <laughs> and um, child abuse um, investigations as well as a result of that incident. Um, and then there was a, a recent incident that came to our attention um, uh, in the last several days, which we're following up on, and, and there might be more information to share on that in the coming days and how we're approaching that. So at present, Obviously, there's a you know ebb and flow of kids who might be appropriate, but between one and two Vermont kids, between four and six million dollars to handle them. Yes. 
It does, that does obviously raise a lot of questions about. Um, <laughs> well, like uh, one very serious one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, uh, the question becomes one of um, four to six uh, million. Four to staffing. Six. Um, four to six million for two, one or two kids. Okay. Yeah, the sad part is this has been going on for quite some time. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I just say something in defense of the system? Yeah, go ahead, it's Dick. Very hard to find private providers who are willing to take kids with a no eject, no reject proposal. <laughs> Um, many of these community providers just don't feel they can handle that kind of kid in the community. And that's the, the real problem. Um, and so you need somebody who's willing, who's able to do that, plus has a facility. But then the question becomes, is the facility Medicaid eligible, which is what this budget is based upon, in order to take advantage of federal funding? Um, but it would be, as I understand it, a locked facility. But I tell you, as, as a former provider, um, it's really tough to say, I won't reject this kid or I won't eject the kid, um, no matter what happens. That's a when very you, when well you're community made, based. That's a very well made point. I, and I, I get that totally. It just seems for four to six million, we should be able to find some other oh, solution. Yeah, I totally agree, Tim, and I'm on board with that other solution. It's that I don't want to be seen as putting all the blame on the Department of Children and Families. No, I think if there's something to blame, it's that we've found other strategies which have really been helpful to reduce the number of kids who need to be at Woodside. I think that's a collective success The <clears throat> just makes this the, the math at the facility more challenged for sure. I guess we'll put this, uh, we know that this is an issue that um, we're, we're gonna have more discussion as we go through this budget process. Um, and so unless we have more comments or questions on the wood side, knowing that it's still a lot of work to be done, I'm gonna suggest we move on to um, uh, the next uh, division, which is child development. Yep. And then we're moving into a uh, year two of our plan, um, the CCFAP uh, plan. Um, also, transportation continues to still be a big focus. We were hoping to have uh, uh, um, evaluated our transportation needs and contracts across the department to see if we could find efficiencies um, and improvements and how we uh, obtain transportation across our different programs because we spend a lot of money on transportation across the department uh, between um, our, our various programs and family services, CDD, uh, reach up and, and other areas. And so we were hoping to find some efficiencies there um, due to COVID um, that, that wasn't able to uh, get to the point where we hope to be right now, um, but we are restarting that work um, also. Um, we are moving forward um, in an incremental modular approach uh, in our uh, BFIS IT system replacement. Um, we've just signed off on the ABC form and that uh, first <coughs> module is starting to move forward. And then you'll see that we're starting, we're starting to evaluate the maintenance and operations costs for that system moving forward. Um, also in OCS, you'll see in the budget, um, you know, that uh, we're looking to move away from um, use, uh, mailing a lot of notices in OCS to using electronic notice systems, which would um, provide a, a, we think, a better service to Vermonters, given many people use electronic communications, but also would, we would realize some postage efficiencies and savings as well. Um, also, um, our reach up caseload looks much different now. Um, as a result of, of COVID-19 than it did in February before uh, the pandemic hit. Um, we've implemented a lot of temporary um, program changes in response with the, uh, many of the systems that our families relied on in terms of education and job support shutting down. Um, we made some changes, um, also um, went to more online and on the phone connection with our families and, and no longer home visiting in response to the pandemic. 
Um, also, our caseloads have gone up with the economy shutting down. Um, more families are on the program. And so uh, that program's gone under a lot of change in the last several months. Um, also, uh, we're still moving forward with the expanded family supported um, housing initiative that was in the initial governor's uh, recommended budget. Um, given how the state responded uh, for homeless families and individuals, um, this initiative is, is more important now than ever. Um, and then also, uh, given that same response to homelessness, um, we're not proposing to move forward with the community-based emergency housing program as it was initially proposed in the governor's uh, recommended budget back in January, um, and that we'll be putting that off, that conversation off in, uh, till, 20, till the 22 budget. Um, just given we're housing a large number of families and individuals to keep them safe during the pandemic, um, it, it, we were not in the position to move forward with our providers uh, to move that forward in 21 right now. Uh, given that we were looking to move to a community-based model where shelter systems and other congregate settings played a big role and reduce our reliance on motels. And right now uh, um, that we're relying more on motels and less in congregate settings just because of uh, the inability to follow some of the safety guidelines in those settings right now. Um, Sean, I um, and I suppose um, Senator Westman will have some more detailed conversations. Um, but when we did the housing, the last housing package, um, we put the administration had submitted a $16 million, and it was a combination um, of, uh, of interventions and um, included uh, supports because many people could get into if once they're in permanent housing, they need support in order to maintain it. Um, and it, um, I believe was calling on the use of Medicaid using some of the money that was in the um, uh, general assistance uh, appropriation, moving it to be the match to help fund um, those Medicaid eligible housing support services for those populations that, uh, not to pay for the housing, but to pay for the support so that they could, if they got into housing, permanent housing, they could maintain it. Um, I'm having a hard time reconciling what you're saying now with that $16 million proposal that was advanced. Are you saying, is that moving ahead or are parts of it being yes, delayed? So, so that is our expanded family supported housing proposal I just touched on. So yeah. that does leverage uh, Medicaid money for those supported services uh, to help families that we place in, in permanent housing to be uh, maintained in housing and retain that housing because that's a, a a difficult time for many families when they first uh, obtain permanent housing. Um, <laughs> they have the supports to be successful long term. Um, the, the dollars that were allocated by the legislature, those 16 million of CRF dollars, um, was directed at families and it, individuals um, that were currently housing in motels. Um, so there was the service dollars component of that. There was mm -hmm. a component to pay for some of the motels. Um, that right now, um, I'm happy to report that FEMA has accepted our first initial claim and we are receiving FEMA dollars. So the state only needs to come up with a 25% match. Normally our hotel spending is 100% general fund um, to the general assistance program. And so um, FEMA support um, has been incredibly important and we continue to submit claims there. Um, but also there was money to expand in that rehousing plan to expand um, uh, the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program, our goal was to end family homelessness, provide a rental voucher for all families with kids um, that, that are currently being housed um, in motels due to COVID. And then uh, rapid rehousing dollars were asked also a part of that for other households to help them move on and, and obtain permanent housing um, with, with really flexible funding um, for our partners to access for those households. And so um, all of those service dollars or the bulk of them have been allocated out to our housing partners across the state and, um, and they're staffing up and expanding their services with those dollars to meet the needs to move these individuals and families out of the motels and into more permanent housing. And we're just starting to see um, the benefits of those resources um, being dispersed throughout Vermont's communities. So, 
if I understand what you're saying is that $16 million proposal is moving forward and you're beginning to see the benefits of it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I just, I was just, uh, when you were saying delayed till next year, I was having a hard time differentiating between that initiative with, um, with that comment. Around. Yeah, so in the governor's initial 21, we had we had proposed eliminating the emergency housing program, the motel yes. voucher program, and making it a community-based program. Yes. Um, and that's what we're delaying. Um, okay. Given where we are with the use of motels and the work the communities are doing, um, we didn't feel we were in a position to move forward with that initiative that on um, the motel voucher program is playing a critical part in keeping homeless Vermonters safe right now while we implement that rehousing plan. Yes. And in many okay. ways, that rehousing plan is our vision for that community uh, provider system. And so the work we're doing now, I think hopefully builds that system and makes the transition to it easier when we move to it. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. And I guess we should probably keep going because you've got how many more uh, boxes here? Um, a, a few. Um, yeah. And then just some other initiatives, and we just touched on it, the housing plan, our reach up caseload. Um, just wanted to touch base on Three Squares Vermont. Um, we did um, issue out um, uh, late spring the pandemic EBT benefits. That was the value of uh, the free and reduced lunch for all um, kids in Vermont um, who are going to schools participating in that program. Um, it was a value of $387 per child. Um, and so um, we were able to get that out working um, with our partners in the Agency of Education and Hunger Free Vermont. And so we put a significant amount of resources in families uh, whose children receive free and reduced lunch. Each child received $387. So, so that what was, was the total payout that went out to families? Um, uh, it, it was it was over ten million dollars. I, I can get you that number. Uh, it was, you know, in the aggregate when we think about the amount of di through all the different uh, streams of funding, um, mm -hmm. it's it's been an incredible flow of uh, federal dollars to the state. I believe. Okay, and that went out to every that went out to every family, right? Regardless yes. of income. Right, uh, regardless of whether you were on three squares or, or not too, which made it complicated. So we had to connect with all families who had kids receiving free and reduced lunch, not yeah. just those receiving three squares Vermont. So it was yeah. all kids on that program in Vermont. So it was a large yeah. number. Okay, yeah. yeah. Another area of work that had to get done and accommodated, so. Yeah, and then the, and just the other benefit to touch on that, that was, uh, the USDA and the federal government created was the emergency full allotment. And so that well, um, each month that we're in a state of emergency, we're able to issue out to each household who's not already at it, the full allotment for their household size. And so that really benefits uh, family, families with multiple members who might not be at it. Um, and each month um, that we're in a state of emergency, um, we're able, it's a, it's a little over $3 million a month in addition that we issue out through that um, uh, emergency allotment. And, and given the extension um, of the emergency declaration by the governor th into September, we'll now uh, are seeking approval from the federal government to issue it out for September. So each month we issue that out, that might be our six months. So just that benefit alone, it'll be close close to $20 million that we'll have issued out after September's benefit goes. So it's a large sum of money that we're um, issuing out to Vermonters. Our concern with this benefit, and we've shared that with the federal government, is that um, it didn't benefit families who, who were already at um, the full allotment. And for many of those households, those are your lower income households who really could have benefited from an increase in their SNAP benefits and they didn't get one. And those tended to be older Vermonters and disabled Vermonters who are already at the max allotment. So they really didn't benefit from this as, as some other families did. Um, we're seeing the benefits to the emergency allotment and the PEBT really went to families with kids. And so there was this other population that really didn't benefit as well, unfortunately. Um, and then we've um, issued out and working with the food bank on the CRF money, the legislature allocated out to the Vermont Food Bank uh, to in increase the food distribution network to address hunger across Vermont. 
Um, so that's work we've been on as well. Also, our FSD team, just in response to COVID, need, has done need to do a lot of work working with the different programs to make sure they're um, implementing proper safety and uh, protocols to make sure our kids are being well cared for in those systems. Um, that, that would include foster care, foster homes as well. Um, also, you know, we're, we're in the midst of another round of relief grants to child care providers, the 12 million um, that the legislature allocated um, for um, uh, uh, child care programs, summer programs, after school programs, uh, CIS, telehealth pr providers, um, as well as the parent child centers. Um, those uh, applications are open for that until next week, and we're evaluating that to disperse that $12 million. Um, uh, also, you know, the, you mentioned this at the beginning, Senator uh, Kitchell, uh, our proposal that will be going before Joint Fiscal Committee on Monday to uh, uh, create these um, school-age online learning hubs as schools open up. Uh, kids are not good school-age kids, particularly K through six, may need a place to go when their parents work are able to provide that level of support for them. Um, so we're looking to expand uh, the system of care for those kids so that they have a place to go to um, for their online learning. And so we're um, rolled out this proposal um, to expand these hubs and also uh, a change so that uh, family-based uh, center homes can increase the number of kids that, that, that they serve who are school age. Uh, up to four kids to, to expand. We believe we need to expand the system of care by about 10,000 slots right now. And in Vermont, there's only 13,000 slots in the system of care pre-existing. So this is a pretty big lift. Um, I've been impressed by the um, inquiry since the uh, press conference by the governor announcing this and rolling it out. We're getting multiple contacts a day from employers and um, uh, school districts, summer programs, um, wanting to sign up and take advantage of this program and, and provide uh, uh, hub and, and child care slots for online learning. So we're pretty excited that um, this is really getting a lot of traction early um, and we're making good progress in rolling it out. Again, just expanded the family supported housing, which we talked about. Um, the, the AHS plan, OEO and ESD have been in tight partnership with that. Um, and then also the, the micro business uh, CRF funds as well. So there's been a lot of work going on in response to COVID plus the original initiatives we had proposed. A lot of work going on. Staff are very busy. Okay. Um, I, I guess you have more slides and that yes. gets into the uh, details yeah, of the budget. Into, uh, and some of this we touched on. So we have some um, and some of these are net neutral. We're just moving because we're delaying things. We're moving money back from the original uh, budget proposal back to the original home in the DCF budget. Um, you know, in admin, you would see that in the delay of the emergency housing initiative. Um, also, an up because we delayed uh, the rollout of ESAP uh, for a quarter from July 1st to October 1st. Um, also, with the move. Uh, a proposed move of bringing in-house the, the CCFAP eligibility to ESD. We would be moving some staff um, from uh, CDD, or the policy staff, to ESD to support that, that move. Um, also, and I, I will defer to Sarah Truckle to explain this, but um, we need to account for how we spend our TANF money throughout um, our programs, because we don't just use TANF in the reach up program, we use it very creatively in Vermont, and we have to submit a five year plan of how we're doing that. And so, that, so we're moving money around to reflect our five year plan. And if you have questions, I'll defer to Sarah Truckle on that. Um, and then the other thing we've touched on this uh, CC fat move. Um, um, we have a uh, MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Department of Labor to, for employment services um, uh, for the Reach Up program, but also for this, uh, the Three Squares Vermont program, our employment and training program. Um, and because it's serving multiple programs and not just Reach Up, we're moving it out of the Reach Up Depth ID and moving it into the DCF admin where ESD's overall costs are. And that's just net neutral, and it just better reflects that, that it's just not a reach out. <laughs> it's serving uh, three squares Vermont recipients as well. 
Um, okay, so the TANF, uh, TANF last I knew had not been increased since it was implemented. Um, is that still at about 47 million? Uh, correct, yeah. Sarah, okay. do you wanna weigh in? Sure. And, uh, and I know that we have a maintenance of effort and I know that we look through, you know, we use uh, earned income tax credit with it. It's pretty complicated at this yeah. point. So um, in order to, um, meet those um, maintenance of effort requirements that are in place. So that's what you're having to do here with uh, your five-year plan to make sure that those requirements are still being met. This is just a technical adjustment. We're moving money between the admin debt ID and FSD to properly show how we're earning those TANF funds. Um, we're not making any programmatic changes with this. It's just a reflection of where we're earning the funds and which debt ID based on how we're reporting that. Okay, all right, so it's more just technical. It is. Um, uh, that's, that's an example of moving to a block grant and what happens. That's why states are very, very leery about um, uh, that used to be the old 4A program and you used to get a federal match and, and it would move back and forth depending on economic conditions. And since we've got that, the, it, it's, um, it, it's just another example of um, uh, and then up a reduction in support for our poorest families. So, um, but that's more of an editorial comment. I'm beginning to sound like Senator Ash, so I'm going to move on to the next. Uh, and yeah. we're obviously going to have more discussion about moving eligibility sure. and referral. Um, although then, but you've assumed those savings in building your budget, Commissioner. Yeah, and you would, and here the downs would be some uh, some savings from bringing that work in house and not uh, having to pay all the providers to do that work based on what it would cost us. And then also the other um, is just um, like our human resource partners, agency of digital services costs are down. Yeah, we, so we know all in. that, that's yeah. everybody shows yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, okay. So ready to move on. Um, uh, family uh, services division, um, you know, we had proposed some positions that would have been needed if Woodside had closed effective July 1st, that's not happened. And so we're just moving, the, moving taking those back out of uh, the family services budget again, that the technical uh, account, uh, reporting regarding the TANF five-year plan, the internal service funds. Um, also, uh, given Woodside is still open, we have one youth there, we um, don't need the replacement funding for residential programs. Um, also, um, with the FMAP increase, it affects our 4 e dot spending, and so that frees up general fund because we have more federal funds. Um, and then also, given um, Woodside is still open, the proposal uh, to expand family group counseling is not needed at this time, and so that, that's a down in our budget as well. I think the question will be, Sean, is will those reversions I mean, obviously that you're continuing to spend a lot of money for the uh, 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 operation of Woodside, but w we wanted to make sure that the resources were there, that if alternative placements and we can shut the facility down in the planning, that there, the resources are there to meet those, the needs of those, um, those kids in other settings. And so can you just confirm that th that is your plan here? Yes, yes, that if um, we move forward with closing Woodside, you'll see in our budget that um, we are proposing some position reductions, just given the number of kids we're serving there and the need for, we don't have that need. Many of those positions are currently vacant, uh, just because um, we've had a lot of attrition over the last year with the conversation around closing. Many staff have moved on and found other jobs, and so, we still continue to experience a loss of staff as a result of those conversations. We had two people, I believe last week, give their notice. And so we are uh, proposing, I think it's 21 out of the 51 positions. Um, however, if, if the program did close with the money allocated towards Woodside, we believe there would be enough to meet the needs for residential placements costs and whatnot from that appropriation. Yeah, particularly if you have two kids and four million, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going. 
child development. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I'm assuming some of this is really a technical moving money around um, yeah, between yeah, yeah. so that um, a big down, in fact, is more just a matter of uh, where where you where the money um, is showing up. Correct. Refer correct. Uh, here we do have one up, as we talked about earlier, the transportation initiative. We were hoping to realize some savings in CDD based on that work. Um, that work's been delayed, and so we need the resources to, for CDD to continue to pay for transportation services, and that's the, the, the one up. We are starting that work now, and so hopefully in the 22 budget, um, that will be addressed there. The one thing we've talked about most of the downs here in the CDD budget, and I know we'll have further conversations regarding um, the, you know, the proposal to move eligibility over to, to ESD from private <laughs> providers. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that we have two grant monitors that go in and work with our partners, the community partners doing that work to, uh, to, to do some uh, grant compliance work. Um, we wouldn't need those positions um, if, if that initiative goes through, um, just because we have staff in ESD that do that work and review our staff's work already. Um, while these are filled positions and these positions would be rift, um, we have a lot of openings right now and I'm very confident that we will find uh, positions that meet the staff's interest and skill set um, and that, that they wouldn't lose employment with the state of Vermont. They just might be doing something different and I'm pretty confident in that. And we're, and we're working on that right now. Um, also, the other thing I would uh, just want Sarah Truckle to highly touch on the subsidy revenue shift. That's the one thing we haven't touched, the other thing we haven't touched on here. So this revenue shift is associated with moving the CCFAP eligibility and referral to ESD. Um, as a result of the way that revenue would then be earned uh, by ESD staff, we're able to offset GF expenses in the admin debt ID, and then we have more CCDF in our block grant, which can now be utilized in our subsidy budget, and we're able to offset some general fund. Okay, and that offset of general fund is how much and where does that reduction show? So it will show in the uh, CDD debt ID, and particularly, I'm just scrolling up, um, you'll see it in uh, line 178, so $128,333 moves from uh, general fund to Fed fund. Okay. And then moving to the, to the next slide, if there's no other questions. Um, Office of Child Support, we touched on here. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. I, yep. We understand th yep. these two yep. things. Okay. Um, uh, I'm assuming um, postage savings is, um, is there an issue with electronic notifications? Are you talking about notifications to um, um, uh, absent parents? And, and custodial parents, yes. And custodial. We send out a lot of notices. Uh, to both parents in that program. Some of them are annual, some are quarterly, some are, are case specific, depending on activity going on. And for a parent who perhaps does not have access to technology, then that would still be done through the usual postal service? Yes, yes, but that would still be an option for families that don't uh, have the technology or don't believe that that works for them. Okay, Senator Ash. When I was on finance for years, there was a an annual discussion about whether insurance companies should have to, basically every year the insurance companies would come in and say they wanted to only have to provide uh, most general notices uh, electronically and not by mail. And each year we would block that proposal because we knew that many people um, have account, you know, email accounts that they change over time. For instance, yeah. a legislator might pr primarily use a legislative address, but then if they use that for their insurance purpose for some reason and then aren't in the legislature anymore. Suddenly the email goes to nowhere and the person might not realize they're missing deadlines. So I think after I left finance, I might have, uh, my guard might have been let down and they might have actually passed that. But I'm wondering whether they're, I'm not, I guess I'm asking, Commissioner, uh, how do you, 
prevent from someone having very serious consequences of what might be an email that goes to a spam folder or a junk folder, which happens all the time. Even emails that we send to each other sometimes as legislators don't arrive as intended. Um, is it possible that someone could lose custody over an email that goes to a spam folder inadvertently? Well, this would be for child support, so this wouldn't involve parental rights or responsibilities. Uh, this would be for their child support uh, order or obligation or the establishment enforcement or modification. Um, I'll be honest with you, Senator, um, those same risks and concerns exist with the mail. If you saw the amount of return mail that we get in our application and document processing center on a daily basis for households that don't notify us of their address change, and then we get mail back, um, we spend a lot of time now um, tracking down new addresses for folks, and that work would also happen for households with emails as well. Yeah, un undoubtedly, it, either system has its issues, except you've just pointed out that at least in the case of hard copy, you receive the thing back, which indicates that it did not have a recipient on the other end, whereas emails can be sent with to an, to an existing address, but that isn't checked regularly or at all, uh, or is inactive. Um, the, the department wouldn't know that. And so Don't you have a like system, it's... though, that can go in and determine if it had been opened? Yeah, we, you know, this is a system we would work with our IT uh, partner, ADS, to design. So there would be some legisl legislative language as well um, regarding this. Um, this will be a system that will need to be developed as well. Okay, I'll look forward I mean, to We certainly could build safeguards in for those concerns, Senator, because I think uh, they are legitimate and valid concerns for sure. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing what the legislation is. And I think maybe when you come back, when we dive deeper into this, it would be helpful to know what the most serious consequence of failure to respond would be. Um, you know, if, it, if it's a minor inconvenience as a result of not responding, that's obviously different than uh, imprisonment. Oh. Understood, and I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, loop in Robin Arnell, our child support director, in those conversations as we get look at that in more detail. Okay. Um, next slide, then. Yes. Um, general assistance here, just um, the conversation we had, just moved some money back to the GA debt ID from OEO, where they would, that those funds would have went out in uh, housing opportunity grants to support the community-based initiative. Here, it just moves it back to the general assistance step to depth ID where we pay for motels. Okay. That's the one you're postponing. So now we're yes. to recap yep. and your caseload is up and because our block grant is o well oversubscribed, this is a general yes. fund. Yes, yes. And so um, we have our, our caseload increase um, that we're able to leverage uh, CRF funds from July through December. And then you would see an up um, in our budget for those costs from January to June that we're not able to leverage. Those would be ge general fund costs. Um, those would definitely be ups. And then also uh, the technical um, TANF five-year plan, technical movement. So really the up here is about, uh, Sarah Truck, if you want to weigh in, about $5 million. About $5 million. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, then, it's a total of... Well, assuming, I don't know, you probably got different growth between July and December and January through June, but um, CRF will cover the July through December um, increase. And so obviously January through June, you're still expecting some caseload increase during those winter months. Yes, the, and these projections are based off um, our contractor, Leslie Black Plumo, who we've always used to project our reach up caseload uh, size and cost um, mm -hmm. over time. Um, and then also, um, we ha do have some downs. There's the internal service fund. Um, although uh, the Office of Child Support, through its child support program and establishing and collecting on orders for families that are currently on reach up or were, and there's some arrears owed, um, with the expansion of unemployment to, to contractors and then also the enhanced unemployment and 
the stimulus checks that the federal government sent out. We, um, under law, are required to wage withhold or intercept those payments. Um, they weren't exempted under the CRF federal legislation. Um, and so we are actually seeing some increase in our revenues, which offset some of our general fund costs in the reach up program. And then again, just the, the net neutral move of the MOU costs <laughs> to the admin debt ID from the reach up debt ID. Okay. Um, here again, just the movement of the emergency housing money over uh, to GA and then the internal service funds here um, are the changes in the restatement budget. And then here, uh, just an internal service fund down in the weatherization program. And then Woodside um, uh, re restoring. Um, uh, could you go back to the other slide on uh, weatherization? Mm -hmm. Internal service fund reduction results in a down. I, I would have thought it would have been internal service fund reductions would give you more money for weatherization. Can you explain that? Yeah, I'll let Sarah Truckle chime in here. So when we received uh, the 5% reduction across the internal service funds, the way yeah. that it impacts each one of our debt IDs results in an allocation across DCF, and this is the allocation for weatherization. So it, it, we no longer have those expenses hitting that debt ID as it relates to the internal service fund. Are, are you trying to understand the interplay with the trust fund in particular? Well, I guess I am. I'm, it's just it, one would think that um, I, I understand what it. I understand what you're doing. Um, um, it's 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 just how that um, trickles down. All right. You, you see a very similar uh, small amount of money in DDS, which has uh, I believe ninety seven percent federal fund and three percent general fund, and we're seeing a, I believe it's a fifty one dollar ISF reduction in that okay. ID. So it's just the way that it it hits each one. Okay. <sighs> What side we're back on that, and uh, I guess we 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 kind of talked about this um, sufficiently, I think, for this afternoon. Unless we have um, want to go back to that discussion, but uh, it's open. We're going to have more information, and it's sort of um, one of those issues that will uh, be a topic of further um, ongoing discussion. And then uh, similar to the conversation we just had as weatherization, as Sarah pointed out, um, we realized a $51 reduction in, from the internal service funds from DDS, who's, but as Sarah indicated, um, this is primarily a federally funded program and regulated program. And so we expend very little general fund here. And so- I do have a question. Um, you've asked through joint fiscal um, to have additional um, staff in, um, disability determination um, due to increased workload. And my question, I, I know some of it is maybe, a, you know, appeals or whatever, but are you anticipating an, an increase that would um, add additional cost to the AABD SUP? Um, there could be, we haven't, um, uh, at, you know, focused on that yet. I think we were being precautionary um, with, the, with those staff based on the request from our federal partner, because historically um, during economic downturns, particularly severe ones, you see requests for disability um, I know. Go, go up. And so they were being proactive there. Um, but at this point, we're not seeing those come to fruition yet, just given the length of time we've been in the economic distress. Normally it takes a longer downturn for that, for that to start to realize. So in the short term, we haven't seen that yet. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? We've gone through all your slides. It's uh, um, about uh, almost quarter after three. Oh, it's Senator Ash. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, it just went up, so you're very quick. Um, Commissioner, I'm thinking on the childcare front, there's been so much 
sort of turbulence as a result of COVID and, you know, the initial reaction of the administration, which was admittedly, you know, you had to move quick and it was the paying 50% of the tuition, even when the place was closed to keep a slot. And then some slots aren't even going to return. Now we've got providers, you know, all over the state making different decisions about reopening um, the proposal before joint fiscal about the 12 million to do grants for community hubs and all that. All of it's so hard because it's statewide. It's like a tsunami of challenges. So I, I preface it all with that and wonder if the administration is contemplating taking a step back and saying, you know what, this system can no longer function like this, where we're asking every parent to make a decision. We're having a, a three-tier childcare system of home-based, center-based, and school-based. It can't go on like this. It's now exhibiting very, in real ways, how much our economy can't tolerate this. So maybe we should have a different approach like universal childcare and make that a statewide program, not unlike K through 12 education and stop with all of these eccentric attempts to Senator Kitchell has a guest um, <laughs> to, uh, to um, yeah, I, you know what I mean? It just seems like it's calling, it's calling out that our current, patchwork system isn't going to handle future situations like this. And the question is whether the administration thinks it might be more efficient and better for the economy to just have uh, some kind of entitlement system for all kids. Yeah. Well, well whether it, um, uh, I will say this, that whether, um, I don't know if, the, if I can say that that's what we're going to move to as a system, but I would say, um, from uh, my prior role as deputy commissioner and our response to our programs there. And now in this role, I think once we have the ability um, and we're not in reaction mode, I think across the board, we're gonna evaluate our programs and our services and, and what we learned, um, what, what worked and what didn't work and maybe how we can reimagine our systems of care so that they're stronger um, in the future and more resilient when we encounter situations like a pandemic or a, or a mass flood to the state or whatnot. And so um, I think that is work we're gonna do as a department for sure, um, and I believe as an agency, but I, it's something we are gonna look at and, and evaluate um, how we responded, what worked, what didn't work, and how can we improve our systems of care moving forward. Well, I hope, I hope you guys will think maybe at even a higher level because K through 12 is a system that no one doubts it's gonna to continue to run because it is an entitlement system with a funding plan, which people can complain about, but it exists. So people know each year, every kid is entitled to K through 12 education. And the what works and what didn't work about our current childcare system, I think we're all gonna know that many things, despite everyone's best efforts, didn't work and couldn't work. And we can keep patching things together and at great expense, or we can just have a system that's predictable, guaranteed. It will come at a cost, but it just seems it's a very inefficient way for a statewide system, a non-system, I should say. Um, and I hope that you guys will think maybe on a much bolder scale than trying to fix little elements of it. You know, uh, this is a, a, a conversation I think we have out ahead of us. Of course, we have so many vested interests um, in maintaining. And so is it a matter of just we need to put more money into the system as we know it or the extent to which people are willing to say, do we really need to um, overhaul um, what sort of this, um, as you use the term patchwork, um, with something um, uh, quite, um, quite and, different. And that's, that's a hard conversation and it'll be, if, well we let the, if we let the quote unquote stakeholders be involved, nothing will change. I think we know that the question yeah. really is, should there be a system which acknowledges there's different needs in different communities and Bobby's neck of the woods, uh, center-based care and home-based care might be necessary as part of a 
system that's appropriate and scaled. And in Burlington, it might be different. And in La Moyle, it might be different, Windsor and so on. But the longer every lobbying interest keeps getting their piece, it means we're going to be very vulnerable to what's going on right now. And uh, I don't know, it just, it just, it seems nuts. Well, um, and, and expensive. It, I agree. Um, and so I see Senator Westman uh, has his hand up as well. Do you have a comment or a question? Um, I just have a comment. Just remember this patchwork that you're talking about only serves less than half the kids in the state. Over half of our kids are um, in unregulated um, um, care without uh, and not state placements. So um, as you talk about that, um, what you're talking about would be a huge sea change. Yep. We, we also know that a, a, a very large percentage of care from that report that was done a couple of years ago, in fact, is um, provided by family members and, and people are fortunate enough to have family members. A lot of that family care relative by par grandparents or aunts is actually at no cost, which I found quite uh, stunning. Well, it does have a cost. It's no cost to the state. No, they were not necessarily paying. Well, that's saying that um, that a mother taking care of a kid doesn't do something of value. And I think that I, I'm talking that about financial compensation. I'm not talking about equivalency. I'm just talking about the data that we got from that report, Rich. No, that, I, you know, I, I, under, I understand that. But that all comes at a cost to someone, whether it's time or it's money. Well, that's what that's true. That's true. Other comments um, of, of DCF staff or Sarah? Um, okay. Um, so it's uh, the end of the week for us. I think McCormick's um, trying to. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator McCormick, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, uh, sorry about that. We had a controversy back in the, in the spring about visitation uh, being in person uh, or, or remote. How did that, and then, and then finally it seemed to get resolved because uh, you folks felt that you could, you could regulate in-person visitation to make sure it was safe. How, how has that worked out? Um, I, I will uh, connect with uh, Deputy Commissioner Johnson and, and get back to you, Senator. That's not an area I've, I've focused on okay. and recently with the, the Woodside issues in the budget, but I believe it is in person is happening um, across well, the state. Happening. But to the extent I, I can get you some, some, hopefully get you some data. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Are you talking about parental visitation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Foster kids. And uh -huh. All right. Um, other um, comments or questions? If not, I know Senator Westman will be having some follow-up um, discussion uh, with, um, with the department folks. Um, so with that, I, um, I think, unless I don't see any more hands, um, I'm going to adjourn uh, this meeting of Senate Appropriations, and we are putting together um, a schedule uh, that uh, witnesses for next week uh, worked with Chrissy, and so I'm hoping that we will get um, more testimony and have the departments and agencies in that uh, we talked about yesterday we wanted to hear from, and uh, we'll move right along as fast as we can. As we know, we've got to have a budget um, in place by October 1st, and um, that's our um, that's our assignment, and I'm sure we'll, we'll succeed. So thank you all for uh, this week, uh, which is advance of the session, and then we're going to actually, uh, the pro tem uh, was, has indicated that we will, uh, the session will officially start again at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. So with that, have a great weekend, everyone, and thank you all.